description of the of the fixed point arithmetic doesn't hold up. So you start to have like it's working perfectly with 120 BPM. If you use 121 BPM, it's going to start to shake around. So you have to kind of find fixes for that. Um, a way to do that is um, to avoid doing a lot of calculations inside the timing code itself is using top half and bottom half IEQ. So you basically have a timing event setting just a flag. N you need to recalculate my, my, my clock, for example, and that's going to be done sometime later on. It, it's not that really important when the filtering happens, but the actual timing code needs to be as fast as possible. So that's one, one way to design it, which I took from kernel development, that you have like hard, uh, time critical things happening and then parts of it that are not so time critical. Um, a big issue I skipped actually is now if you, you start to have um, concurrency, you have your hardware running on the one side and then you have your GUI code running on the one side and then you have the whole sequencing and MIDI control part running on the other side if, is, if you start to use threads. Um, and basically if you, have to, if you use threads you need an OS. So there's a, quite a lot of uh, real-time OSs out there for embedded platforms. Some of them are open source, some of them are pretty expensive. Um, but it turns out that you, you end up having quite a lot of complexity as well, and like, of course, overhead as well, especially uh, data overhead, because every th thread needs to have its own, its own stack space. Um, I decided against it and decided just basically to have this pretty simple driver main loop architecture using interrupts. Um, so if you... If you um, if you look into, into the source code of the framework, you're going to see this big run loop, um, checking some flags from the, from the top half, then doing basically what the firmware is doing, and then a lot of very specialized, optimized interrupts handling MIDI, like incoming MIDI bytes are just stored in the ring buffer and then parsed later on, but MIDI clock bytes are, are, are um, acted upon immediately. Then you have I.O. polling, um, which is taking place in an interrupt as well. And basically, all the rest that's not that important is just running in the main loop, and um, the latency of that is not really is not really tight. Um, so I skipped this one part about the hardware, which is uh, another part which needs some pretty tough real time. Sometimes it depends on the hardware. Um, so for example, if you need to to bit bang external chips, you need to to take care of some some timing constraints. You have to have a clean clock. You have to react in certain ages in a, in a specific time. And another part of it is to I'm using I'm using shift registers to pull the input. So basically, I have like 16 buttons I think to to pull, and you need to pull them fast enough so that you don't miss a click, for example. So that uh, that's this whole kind of bottom half which just like reads in the shift register, and the top half which is going to parse it and generate the events later on. Um, you can also always use, if you, if you can use the inbuilt hardware capabilities of the, of the Atmel Go for it, like for example for SPI communication, that's a huge time saver. It's just like trigger SPI transfers and hardware and then have some interrupt when, when it's finished to have some kind of, of DMA-like um, DMA -like capabilities. Um, if you're using the new X Mega um, device by Atmel, you have like a pretty nice DMA capability and like interrupts that you can chain and interrupts acting on, on, on much more different flags than on, on this uh, first ad mega. So if, if, if you can use it, they're, they're starting to get available, uh, go for the X mega. Um, so that was the part about timing, which is I think the part I spent the most time on. It's still not working right exactly. Um, I think I, I'm starting to read in this whole medical and nuclear hard real time stuff, how they're going about it. Um, and I think there's a lot that can be said in one year about it. Um, and now I'm getting to the fun part of the talk, is like debugging techniques. Um, if, you, if, you, if you do coding, you know that you spend quite a lot of time just fixing bugs. Uh, it's actually much worse when you're starting to do hardware near programming and better programming, because on the one side you have like this restriction of code space and RAM space. So it's, it can happen pretty quickly, for example, just the stack is overwritten and just wondering what the hell is happening with the device. Um, and then you also have the issue that you're actually running on real-world hardware that you can touch that uh, mostly, if, if you solder it yourself, you're not sure you, did, you solder it correctly. And you can have like all kind of weird issues creeping into that through the fact that you're running it on hardware. And then every time you're actually testing the device or building stuff on it, you're interacting with it as well. So you have these kind of weird Heisenberg bugs happening. Um, what happens very often as well is you have toolchain bugs. 
so that the compiler just generates crappy, crappy code and you spend some, some time hunting, hunting it down. Especially like, if it crashes, you don't see like segmentation fault, you just see stuff happening. And um, the, be the best thing was I didn't in initialize the external RAM, so it would like run for a few milliseconds was floating on the external RAM lines, and it would do all kinds of stuff. Like if, if I looked at it this way, it would start correctly, and if I looked at it this way, it would not start correctly, so I started to look for shorts and started to like stress test the device, see where it was coming from, like maybe if I just press this button, it will work. And at the end, it was just one line of code that was falling. I spent like, I think, two weeks hunting that down. <laughs> I actually opened like 100 devices and swapped the capacitors on everyone. And at the end, I realized, okay, it was just one line of code. <laughs> um, so you need to keep your eyes, your ears, everything open, and, and always question, is this coming from the software? Is this coming from the hardware? Is it my fault, or is it maybe the tool chain's fault? Often it's your fault, but uh, it's often it bites you in the head, like you're, you're searching for something, and like three days later, you see, okay, it's not working with GCC 4.2, and I need to use GCC 4.2.1. And that's where this examining compiler output comes in pretty handy. When you see it just misses a register when an interrupt is happening, you have to be aware that that, 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 that can, can happen. So uh, of the tools you can use to debug the whole thing, I think the most useful is actually your oscilloscope, even if you're working with code, because you can just like see what the code is actually doing. If you're trying to toggle a pin, nothing happens, and you see it just like a half voltage on the scope, you know that maybe a hardware problem is involved, or if you see it happening uh, like uh, irregular times, you can see, that's all the stuff you can see with the scope, basically just like putting a probe in. Um, you can look for voltages, for shorts, for, you can trace communication if you have like a, a memory scope. You can uh, look on different channels at one time if you have a multi-channel scope, which is pretty useful, like trigger on one and look what the other one is doing. Uh, you have a lot of tools on your oscilloscopes as well where you can like measure, measure um, the width of a peak. So what, what I like to do to measure, for example, the CPU usage of an interrupt routine is just like trigger light at the beginning and pull it down at the end. And then you can just like use the measuring, the PVM measuring on, on, on your scope and it shows you like 30%, 40%. It's actually pretty, pretty nice. Um, the one thing you, you, you need to, to, uh, to think about is when you design your, your PCB is just put a lot of test points everywhere and label them. So you, you don't have to go hunting for, for the serial interface and go like, oh, it's this pin and then just destroy the pin by putting the, the, the probe onto it. Um, one thing that's pretty useful as well is a logic analyzer, which, which is basically a digital multi-channel oscilloscope and usually it comes with software that can debug protocols. So if you're debugging SPI communication, if you do it on a scope, you're gonna go, you're gonna go nuts. And there you can just see that maybe the address is wrong or that the command is, is missing. So logic analyzer, you can buy them for 100 euros, like small USB logic analyzer that are actually um, sufficient for, for microcontroller programming. Um, now I'm gonna show some, some tricks I use when uh, debugging stuff. So one, one thing that's pretty nice is to use a, a piezo and connect it to different test points. So if you have like a, um, a regular clock interrupt, you can hear it if it changes in pitch. You can hear it, the latency is changing. You can hear when spe specific events are happening. And the, the pretty nice thing about piezos and not using LEDs is you, you can hear frequencies much better than seeing um, brightness. And you don't need to look at the circuit to know if it's working, actually. You can just like, if it goes like, pick, 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 you know it's working correctly. And if, if I press this button, it goes like, you know, okay, something is wrong without having to look at it and you can concentrate on the code. Um, so it's, it's pretty nice, especially if you're synchronizing stuff, you can hear uh, uh, shifting clicks pretty easily as well because they, they change in, in texture. Um, but of course, the other big debugging trick is using LEDs and showing states in LEDs and just having them blink and you can hook up the scope to the LED and have that as well. And it usually doesn't add any latency because you're just using a set bit, clear bit instruction to, um, to set or clear the, the LED. Um, but of course, that, that's just like useful for a few bugs, where you, especially if you're working with parsers, but most of the time it's very useful to actually log and print stuff. Um, the, the bad thing about logging and printing is that it actually modifies the way your software behaves because uh, you're using the inbuilt communication channels and it's going to add latency, it's going to modify your buffers, it's going to modify your state. 